you, you were saying something out there about an early 90s pickup truck. What can I do for you? I need you to tell me who was driving that truck across the street. I see a lot of trucks across the street. You know the one I'm talking about. You said you weren't a cop. <laughs> I'm not. Well, if you ain't no cop, you're not my customer, and my break is over. I think you know exactly which truck I'm talking about. Really? Welcome back to Movie Show Plus. I'm Paula Fournier here with the famous Clint Howard. <laughs> <laughs> um, so your family has been in the business a long time, starting with your father. Yes. And you guys are, I just looked this up not too long ago, you're about 40 movies away from meeting your dad's quota here. Oh, Lord, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Pop's been in the business a long, long time. I mean, since the 40s. I think Frontier Woman was my dad's first role. Um, and uh, I've been professionally acting for over 50 years, actually now technically 51 years. So, yes, we've the whole family's been doing it a long time. And... Uh, I know I can I can speak for Ron and, and 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 Dad that you know our family has been so blessed and and we're so we feel so fortunate that we've been able to continue doing this and continue to have the adventures and continue to be a part of the, the industry. It's just uh, you know it it beats the heck out of just about everything else. <laughs> so uh, did Dad start you out in the business, or is this something you wanted to do? Well, Paula, I was two years old when, when I first entered the entertainment business. I don't really remember. Um, it, was, it was actually it was a, a coincidence, and it worked out great for me. Um, my brother had been hired to be in the Andy Griffith Show, and he was seven years old, and I was two. And my dad would normally watch Ron on the set of the Andy Griffith Show. My dad was like certainly a mentor for Ron and I, and mom was certainly around, but mom was a housewife. But dad was continuing his acting career also and, and continues to this day to act. I mean, my, my goodness, my dad works more than I do. Um, but anyway, back in 1961, um, my dad got a job. And my dad could not be with Ron on the set of the Andy Griffith Show. So mom had to take me, a two-year-old, down to the set and kind of babysit me and watch Ron because our family just did not believe in that whole legal guardian thing or having some stranger watch children on the set. So anyway, I was down visiting, and the director saw me. And, and just thought I was the cutest thing since, I don't know what, sliced bread. That's not quite the right expression. But anyway, he asked if I could, if, if I, they would be willing to put me in one scene. And I did. I did a, a scene in the Andy Griffith show. I played a character called Leon in 1961. And I ended up doing five or six episodes of the Andy Griffith show. And just like my brother, we sort of by osmosis had gained some sort of a comfort level with the industry. Uh, both Ron and I do not remember when we weren't in places like theaters or around movie sets or around entertainment people. Right. Um, so it, it, once it became apparent that there's a, a cute little boy, you know, uh, that, that could act, I got an agent and started working. So, you know, from, the, from that, if my dad hadn't gotten that job and I hadn't gone down to the set of the Andy Griffith Show that day to be babysat, I probably wouldn't be in the entertainment business. Wow. So with all of these years that you've been in, how do you tell somebody, an actor that's coming up, what advice would you give them for the longevity in business? Because kids start out very young, but they don't last too long anymore. <laughs> well, I would probably try to discourage it. <laughs> not that I haven't had a wonderful run in the business and not that I, f I find it exhilarating and, 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 and very interesting. It is also a tough business and it, it's, f it's filled with um, disappointment and anxiety uh, and insecurity. So 
I don't quite know why, Paula, that, that, that sort of our family was able to adapt to all those negatives and continue pursuing it. But I, with, for young people, I would need to certainly try to remind them or, or tell them that it ain't, it ain't a bed of roses and it ain't glamorous. It's really hard work. And I would probably discourage children uh, only because it is such a time-consuming task for the parents. Um, it, you know, when you place a child in the adult world of the entertainment business, it's, it's not necessarily a negative, but it, it takes a lot of extra parenting to help guide your child when, you, when you're putting your child in an environment that is not sort of normal. Uh, now, my parents were just, my, my mom passed away several years ago, and she, my mom, Jean, she was a great lady, and dad is, Rance Howard is doing great. And, you know, they just, they, they, they nurtured us, and they mentored us, and they taught us, and, and not just about show business, but about how to sort of handle life and understand, try to put, try to put us in perspective. And what, what Ron and I did as children were just, we just had a job. It was just it was just work, and to this day, listen. I, I am always looking for gainful employment, and I always try to be a really good good employee because that's just the way I was taught. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like your family really, your parents really kept you grounded in this business, and. Uh... Well, yeah, just you know, my parents both came from the Midwest, and they were, you know, what they would call children of the Depression, and uh, they were the ones that made the jump into show business um, and and Ron and I are both so grateful that you know mom and dad had the absolute unmitigated audacity to go from Oklahoma to New York City in the late 40s or whatever it was maybe early 50s late 40s I think it was they a couple of hicks from Oklahoma literally just jumped in a Plymouth and went to New York and broke into show business and you know, I don't think I have the walnuts to do that. <laughs> and, and Ron has always questioned whether he had the walnuts to make a leap like that. And yet we're so grateful that dad and mom had that push and desire to have a better life. Not that farming and, and living in the Midwest is, is not a good life, but it was like that dad had dreams. And so he followed those dreams. And, and my goodness, uh, with hard work and, and lots of luck, it paid off. Okay, so working on this project, Sandcastles, what do you think, what brought you to the picture and what do you think will, uh, how will it do in the film festival genre? And well, well I, think, I think Sandcastles has a really good chance of surprising people in terms of, of really interesting characters. Um, you know, you keep your fingers crossed and, you know, the, but the, the, the performances of the keys, I, I think, are going to be really good. What I saw was was really interesting acting, actors getting to do really interesting material. And I think Clenet, the director, understands sort of what, what he needs. And right now, you know, it's a frenzy to try to capture it. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a real hope that, that, that Sandcastles can find a really nice niche in the festival circuit mm -hmm. as a non-genre, really good, you know, a solid drama. Um, that, 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 that touches on really interesting kind of ideas. Mm -hmm. So when this crew calls you again, when Clinet calls you again, you're in, right? Oh no, in a heartbeat, if, if the Sandcastle team called me, I would, I would fire back up in a heartbeat. Okay. So what has been your favorite, favorite film to be on? And you've worked with your brother a lot, so are one of those films, well, or the smaller ones? I, I, always, I always enjoy being directed by my brother. I always enjoy working with him. We have a wonderful relationship and, and um, ever since the beginning, I've always just felt like it's really cool that, you know, here, here's my brother and he's directing and he trusts me and we have a, a really good form of communication and I understand what he needs from me and he sort of knows my limitations or, you know, I mean, he's the chief. When he's directing, he's the chief and I'm an Indian mm -hmm. and I'm way okay with that.
you know. Uh, I, the, the experiences, I've had just a couple of memorable ones with Ron. I mean, uh, working on Apollo 13 was, was uh, you know, probably my favorite experience. But also getting to work on The Grinch, getting to be around the set of Frost Nixon, um, you know, watching Frank Langella and Michael Sheen act uh, in a really up close and personal way, working with really good material, I found really inspiring and very interesting. Uh, but you know what, I've also had fun working in genre movies. I mean, you know, Ice Cream Man was a hoot. And working on Evil Speak, which was like my first real kind of adult role. Um, kind of remember, I segued from being a child actor who had a parent on the set right. to finally, I turned 18 years old and my dad quit showing up. I mean, you know, I kind of wanted him to quit showing up. I was <laughs> ready for that. But, but then getting to act on my own and Evil Speak was a horror movie I did that, that was the first time that I had sort of stepped out as an adult. And, mm -hmm. and, and I have very fond memories of that. Uh, you know, the, the business is filled with lots of great experiences. And also, too, you know, I've had my share of, I, I wouldn't necessarily call them nightmares, but, you know, I've been put in positions that I think the common man would call dubious, you know. Um, but in, in, in the grand scheme of things, it, it's all been really good. And, and to answer your question about my favorite movie, it would have to be Apollo 13. Yeah, that's one of my favorites of you, too. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, Apollo 13 was just such an honest portrayal of such an interesting event. And, and as filmmakers, with, I was, you know, I'm always kind of close with Ron when he's making a movie. And, 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 but Tom Hanks and Kevin Bacon and Gary Sinise, we all started realizing that the men, and at the time NASA was all men, mm -hmm. at the time these men that were dealt this hand, dealt this crisis. The way they handled it in real life was just so good <laughs> that sort of all we had to do was sort of get out of the way and, and not just recreate it, but just remember that, you know, this is not cowboys and Indians or it, it, it these were engineers and test pilots and problem solvers sort of solving problems the old-fashioned way. This, you know, we, we realized we weren't making all the right stuff. And we, we also had the advantage on Apollo 13 of being surrounded by several wonderful technical advisors. Uh, we had a fellow, Dave Scott, who's an astronaut, the first astronaut to drive on the moon. He was one of our full-time technical advisors, which is a, a joy to work on any movie like, you know, a Ron Howard movie, a big studio movie, as these technical advisors are around. And we could go, any, any one of us could go and sit in chairs like this next to a man who drove on the moon and <laughs> talk to him. And I found that to be enlightening and also just personally very entertaining. Yeah, that'd be, I, I can't imagine being able to talk to somebody who was on the moon. Well, yeah, I know. Well, me too. And you know, and the, and the funny thing is, uh, and it wasn't just Dave Scott. We had uh, a flight director who came and, and, and stood by and worked as a technical advisor. We had, um, uh, I think, a navigations officer, an old retired navigations officer came in and, and was around. So we could always pick their brains. But when I was talking to, to Dave Scott about the, the, you know, his, his moon adventures, he said, you know, they spent, NASA spent millions and millions of dollars building the, 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 the rover, the, the, what they were going to drive on the moon. I'm not mm -hmm. sure they call it the rover. Yes, it is. Is that what it was? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, there's a rover up on Mars now, too. Yes. But anyway, the, 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 the vehicle on the moon. And Dave Scott got in that vehicle and started operating it and realized they could have saved themselves a whole lot of money and just basically stripped down a golf cart. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, you know, these are the things. I, I, I am so grateful for the experiences that I've had in the business and because, you know, those moments. And, and uh, I have another moment, real briefly, that getting to work on Cinderella Man, uh, Angelo Dundee, who was a, you know, probably the greatest fight trainer that's ever lived. Mm -hmm. Angelo was Muhammad Ali's trainer and, and Sugar Ray Leonard's trainer. Well, he came on as technical advisor on Cinderella Man. And Angelo, he passed away a, a while ago. Boy, Angelo was a sweetheart and a wonderful guy. 
and he loved to talk, and he loved to tell stories. And while I was there on Cinderella Man, numerous times, I sat in a chair next to Angelo Dundee and would ask him one question and then just sit back and hear stories about Muhammad Ali, hear stories about when he, you know, pre-Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay, mm -hmm. his stories when he was trying to get this kid to fight and you know, learn how to fight right, and, and his stories about Sugar Ray Leonard. It was just unbelievable. The, the the people I've gotten to meet and and the the stories I've gotten to hear. Mm -hmm. Now, for this film that you're out here in the Midwest for, we're in Indiana right now. Um, we filmed some in Michigan last week. Uh, tell us a little bit about your character in the movie Sandcastles. Well, you know what, Sandcastles is a really interesting project for me because I got contacted in in normal channels. I got an email from my manager saying that there was a company that was interested. And I think I'd heard something about the project, but I didn't know too much about it. And I got on the phone with Clonet, the director, and I had a wonderful conversation with him. And, and of course, I read the script, and I, I liked the script. I, I, I thought, wow, this is different, because it's not a genre movie, it's a drama. And it's about real human beings, and they're, they're not behaving you know, necessarily kind of the way you'd hope they'd behave. And, and, you know, they're going through life on life's terms, and sometimes it's not always, you know, good. But anyway, as, as I, I was talking to Clint A, I realized, you know, I go, I think I'm getting ready to go to work for a bunch of very passionate young filmmakers mm -hmm. making a movie that the, the, it's not like these guys are out trying to make a buck. It's not like they're trying to, you know, they've got some great horror movie idea they're trying to do. These guys are just very passionate about storytelling. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I was available. And I also, I, you know, I look for gainful employ, employment and I, I like to be a gainful employee. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, when, when everything got worked out, I signed on and Clinet explained to me right away that they had originally thought of me as they were writing the script. Jordan, uh, a great guy, playing, a, he's doing a great job. I did a scene with Jordan and he just, he nailed it. Um, but they had envisioned me as sort of a red herring. And I think that's a pretty good call. I, I don't want to give away too much of the, the, the movie here, uh, but I just think that I can be an interesting curve in a movie. And the way the scenes laid out, they, they, they played like that. And um, I, I, I really enjoyed it, and it was fun. And getting to come to Indiana, part of a nice, wonderful adventure. I mean, I, I, you know, I get to travel quite a bit. I've never, I don't believe I've ever worked in Indi Indiana before. So this was a, a first, and I, I found it you know, really cool, Goshen, I mean, for crying out loud, you know, getting to be in Goshen for a few days is just, uh, is, is, is great. I, I think you would agree with me that the town here is almost um, another character in, in the film. When you look uh, down here on Main Street in the theater that we're going to be filming in in a couple weeks here. Well, you know, that's the goal, obviously, as a filmmaker, is to use all your tools, mm -hmm. uh, whether they be the talent on the set, uh, whether it be the material, uh, whether it be effects uh, or whether it be the locale. Uh, lots of movies have done wonderful jobs of capturing a certain locale. I mean, Fargo comes to mind yeah. as a, just a wonderful, the Coen brothers just did a brilliant job of just putting us right there in Fargo. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Goshen and the look, the time of the year, Everything is, is, lines up to where this, you know, this movie really needed to be shot here and really shot at this time of the year. So the timing has been great. Great. Well, we're just about out of time here. We've got to get you on a flight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Back to yeah. LA for more work. Well, that's what <laughs> happens. I mean, I, you know, I, I fly in, I, you know, I, 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 I put makeup on and I do my thing and then I fly home. <laughs> Well, it doesn't sound like a bad life. No, no, as long as the check clears. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Oh, it's no. been great working oh. with you and, and talking with you today. I really appreciate well, it. Well, listen, Paula, thank, th you. thank you. It was, it was I, ha I really honestly did ha have a blast, and it was a wonderful interview.